The Defense Intelligence Agency is in a transformative era of modernization for its top secret network, the Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communications System, known as JWIX. In this interview, we spoke with DIA Chief Information Officer Doug Casa to learn more about his priorities as CIO, get insight into the JWIX modernization effort, and find out what's in store for technology innovation. If you enjoy this interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for the leaders of GovCon, please drop a comment below or email studio at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Doug Casa, Chief Information Officer for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to get your thoughts on the global intelligence landscape. To set the scene for our conversation, can you give me an overview of what's going on in global intelligence today? Absolutely. I've been in this community now for uh, over 20 years, which is hard to believe, uh, but I've certainly seen a lot of changes over time. Before I got into my role as CIO here at the Defense Intelligence Agency, I came from the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And one of the jobs that I had was actually managing our process for defining intelligence priorities. And what I had seen is certainly a significant change over the years, especially over the past decade. Uh, what we originally looked at around the world were problems that could be defined by a specific country or a specific region or a particular topic like terrorism. And now what we see today is that the world is more interconnected than ever. And we've seen this with COVID as we were looking at where, to, where were the origins, how was it going to spread, what did we think was going to happen, how would countries be impacted. And what we certainly saw was is that everything was related. And also what we see today is this new dynamic of social media. And so a new source of data that we haven't had in the past. And what this means is there's a new dependency on an IT architecture to not only collect that data, but to make sense of it and process it and exploit it and get it to where it needs to go into production so we can provide intelligence to policymakers all the way up to the White House or warfighters that are across the Department of Defense. And that's where I really have seen the intelligence community change, both in priorities and how we characterize those priorities, given that interconnectedness, but also our response and how we make sense of all of this new data that we're receiving. And Doug, I know the DIA has been working to modernize its decades-old top-secret communication network, the Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communication System, known as JWIX. And the agency recently made its latest step forward in that effort with the announcement of its contract recipient, Invictus, in December. Can you talk about the importance and the urgency behind the modernization of JWIX? Sure. So when I refer to a new IT infrastructure for collecting and disseminating and managing intelligence information, JWIX is a key component of that. And the network started uh, almost, well, over 30 years ago at this point. And it was a proof of concept where we took a video feed to test it at a secure level between our headquarters in Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon. And it was a successful test. We were able to, to actually transmit secure video across the network. And this was at the beginning of the internet when it was becoming commercialized and we had extra bandwidth. So we would add services such as email and other production capabilities. And it's really evolved into what JWIX is today, which is the top secret SCI network, sensitive compartmented information network for sharing intelligence, not only across uh, the IC and the Department of Defense, but with any federal partner that relies on intelligence to perform their function. And when I think about how far we've come, uh, I look back to the days of when I used to be a server administrator, database administrator uh, within the government. My job was very manual. It was, I would look at the server logs every day. I would make, you know, do the maintenance that was required, but it was a very manual process. And where we're moving for, to in terms of technology is a lot of automation. And that's what JWIX is really looking to take advantage of. We've broken down our modernization program into three areas. The first is tech refresh. So it's replacing the old equipment. And when I say equipment, I'm referring to things like routers and switches and servers and storage capabilities, et cetera. But then the next piece of that is also cybersecurity. And a lot of that centers around the principles of zero trust. And the way that I define zero trust for ourselves within the agency is knowing everything and everyone on your networks, but constantly validating their presence, making sure that 
everyone that is connected and in our environment is a valid entity that is supposed to be there in a secure way. And as we think about that, that goes into also the third piece of automation, of automating in a secure way. And we often refer to artificial intelligence. And I view artificial intelligence in the context of networks is automating the management of the network. And what I mean by that in the context of security and zero trust of when we do identify anomalous behavior, things that don't fit the common pattern of the activity that's on the network, we can identify it immediately and isolate it and take immediate action. And moving away from the old days that I described of manually doing that into an actual automated way driven by artificial intelligence that allows us to more effectively manage the network. But it also gets down to performance as well. And I always... I always compare JWICs to the Beltway, like within the within the DC area. Um, it is that wide area network, that circle, that highway that brings you around the entire intelligence community and the entire federal government, just like the Beltway does 495, where you use that to get off of various exit ramps to different towns. And those towns are essentially the local area networks across the federal government that connect to that JWICs highway system. And when we look at automating the management of JWIX and where we're heading into the future, it also allows us, just like your Google Maps or Waze app, app does on your phone that you might use when driving, what we're looking to do is automate the management. So when we look at where network traffic is building up, where we might be reaching peak performance, or where we're running into issues around the world where we might lose a circuit, we can automatically fail over to the most effective route. And that goes down to security as well, as I mentioned, uh, when we look at anomalous traffic, we can identify it, we can segment it off, and then we can have greater security and performance of the network as a whole. And that really summarizes where we're focused on JWIX modernization. It's the refreshing the old equipment, it's building in the principles of zero trust, and then it's getting to more of the autonomous operation of the network. Doug, you mentioned earlier, um, I want to dig into the cloud conversation. There's a lot of activity going on in the federal government around cloud. The DOD is moving forward with its $9 billion JWCC contract. And of course, the intelligence community has its 15-year C2E contract in place. Can you elaborate a little bit more on where JWIX fits into the cloud conversation? And how does it aim to interoperate with all of these systems and networks? Sure. And it gets back into that highway system metaphor that I referred to. So the cloud is on multiple fabrics. It's on the unclassified fabric. So, you know, the traditional access that we would think of from home. It's on the secret network, but then also on the top secret. And when we look at the top secret, that's where JWIX becomes a key component because it, it's the highway system that gets you around to the various towns, those towns being, again, the local networks that a federal agency has, or in this instance, a cloud presence. And the value of JWIX in that sense is that we're building those cloud peering points with the vendor community to understand where do we need to connect? Where is the most efficient place around the world to be able to create those off ramps and on ramps on the JWIX so we can share that information that's within those cloud services. That's a partnership not only across the DOD uh, and across the intelligence community, but also with the vendor community who's providing those cloud capabilities. And that's a key component of our JWIX modernization is identifying where those peering points with cloud services need to be with JWIX. I want to talk about classification. Uh, the, the intelligence community has seen a historic shift towards more unclassified work. And you've said that has sparked changes in the way the DIA develops software. Can you elaborate on the impact unclass work has had on the agency's software development? Sure. Well, Certainly COVID forced a paradigm shift uh, several years ago. And at DIA at the time, prior to COVID, we really didn't rely much on our unclassified network. It was maybe a few hundred users. Uh, and then almost immediately overnight, it turned into several thousand users online. And we really had to shift our approach for how we supported the IT infrastructure for that workforce that was now working from home and needed to be productive. That was certainly a partnership with the vendor community where we have set up a virtual desktop, which we use today uh, to continue that teleworking environment. And we were one of the first agencies actually in the community to stand up a secure FOUO accredited environment. Uh, we plan to continue that, um, but it's expanding in terms of how can we now push 
a lot of our IT functions, particularly software development, to the low side. Uh, as we've seen, especially with our vendor community, a lot of that software development uh, is going to continue on the low side. And that requires us to mirror the low and the high side and have that kind of seamless cross domain so we can effectively develop and then push that over into the operational environment. One of my priorities as CIO is, is creating what I'm calling a capability delivery pipeline. And the benefit of this is actually threefold. One, of course, is to allow access to the broadest array of technical expertise that we can bring into our environments, take advantage of that across the community and not uh, just re refine everything to working within a SCIF. The second piece, though, goes into data standards. And when we think about this, this gets down into things like zero trust of how do I ensure that I'm operating in a secure environment uh, that's accredited to our standards to be able to ultimately operate on the top secret network, but doing so in a way to where I'm creating something that when I push it up, I'm not recreating it to add those security features in. So it's thinking about security first within that entire process. But just as importantly, it's the data standards that make everything interconnect together. And I came across a statistic several years ago. I think it was um, a study published by GAO that said most many software development efforts are behind budget or behind schedule and over budget. And really what that came down to is not anticipating what requirements needed to be designed to. And so when it was pushed to the operational environment, a lot of things needed to be refactored and redeveloped. The goal of my capability delivery pipeline that we're standing up is that that low side environment looks exactly like any environment we would deploy to on the high side, but also we're setting the stand data standards right up front to be able to be interoperable. So these are things like tagging standards for sharing information with other agencies that have a similar function to where we need to integrate. Or it's international systems, uh, which is a big priority of ours as a CIO organization, as of an agency, to where we are creating applications, we are creating software that's 5i interoperable from the beginning, as opposed to trying to tack it on later uh, as you know, an afterthought or um, as, a, as a design that wasn't intended to work with something else. And that's really the, the intent of that capability delivery pipeline environment that I'm building is that we can do everything to the greatest extent possible on the low side and port that up to the high side. Building on that, we actually recently spoke with John Sherman, and he said that a major priority for the DOD is working closely with global allies. Um, moving beyond interoperability just within the U.S. government, like you were just talking about, and broadening that to working with global allies and partners like Five Eyes, for example, um, what role does JWix play in creating that um, secure, collaborative environment for working with those partners? For really since the beginning of time, um, when we think about our international systems, they were developed as separate, separate and disparate from what we would use in our native environment um, on in our network. And so what we ended up doing was creating these customized systems that uh, were separate and distinct to where we could have U.S. users and users from other nations, especially our 5i partners. Um, we are the uh, designated by the DNI as the community service provider for a capability called Stone Ghost, which is a separate system that the 5i partners use together. Um, and DIA is the lead for that. As we move into the future, we want to get rid of the point-to-point -point systems and work from our native environments. So meaning to the system that we log into the U.S. to do our day-to-day -day work seamlessly interfaces with the systems that other countries have, uh, particularly the 5i that, that we share intelligence with, in their native environment. And so you're not logging into something separate. It is all interconnected together. We figured this out, especially within DIA, for those that we call integrees. So they're essentially uh, five I integrees that are employees of DIA to where we are now not pushing them into a separate environment. We are all on the same system, but in a secure way. And that really comes down back to what I said, to the data standards and the data strategy we have for secure, securely sharing information. But the future looks like extending that to other partners, um, uh, international partners that we work with uh, on particular given problems to get away from the point to point systems to where it is a system with secure boundaries, secure parameters to where we can seamlessly interchange uh, functions and information, but based on access rights, based on your role, based on your function. And that's where we're really where we're going in the future. 
Um, DIA has partnered with several other agencies in doing that. And uh, again, we perform that function as a service for the broader community as designated by the DNI. Thank you. Doug, I'm curious, what emerging technologies do you anticipate will have the greatest impact on our standing in the global power competition in the next few years? And where are you seeing opportunities for meaningful tech growth in the U.S.? So when I think about this, it kind of brings us back to where we started of how interconnected the world is and how much data that we're bringing in, uh, particularly with open source. But this has always been the case. You know, when we think about our other uh, means of collection, um, DIA is uh, the functional manager in the community for Mazin, uh, which is a lot of technical intelligence and a lot of uh, data, which takes up a lot of storage, a lot of processing power. Um, we've always had more information that than we're able to process and make sense of and disseminate. That's always been the case. Where I think the, the next big innovation will come from is in decision modeling. So right now we have so much data that it is impossible to make sense of everything and look at everything and process and understand everything that we have on our plate. The next evolution, I think, of technologies will really focus on that decision modeling is actually making sense of it of understanding what the historical trends are and based on those historical trends, actually matching it up with what potentially could happen in the future to actually think about, okay, here's what is gonna happen. It's, it's in a sense artificial intelligence, but I would label it more as decision modeling. Um, getting past just the binary yes, no of what traditional data analysis has been to thinking about that in, in, a, in a new way uh, and a new dynamic bringing all of these sources of information together. Our data strategies uh, over the past several decades have really been isolated within the silos of our collection disciplines, whether it's geospatial intelligence or uh, signals intelligence or human intelligence, which DIA also plays a big role in, but bringing all of those together into one environment to where we can actually look at what are the similarities and discrepancies to be able to bound the problems more closely. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at DIA. Thank you. Thanks for having me.